In November, President Ronald Reagan and his new Soviet opposite number Mikhail Gorbachev met for the first time in Geneva at a summit on arms limitation. Both leaders wanted to reduce the amount being spent on armaments, but were wary of the other's intentions, with Reagan's Star Wars missile defence project and the Soviet involvement in Afghanistan proving particular sticking points. But the two leaders got on well personally and seemed keen to try and work something out. A day after the Geneva summit, Microsoft launched its new operating system known as Windows. Bill Gates' firm had been working on the idea of a graphical user interface, a GUI, for some time, and had announced the concept in 1983, though Amiga's launch earlier in the year had beaten them to the punch in terms of a public release. A fierce competition would rage for a few years between Windows 1.0 and its competitors IBM Topview and Digital Research's Graphical Environment Manager, GEM, which was used on the Amiga, but Windows would win out to become the preeminent operating system on PC going into the 1990s. The European community grew by two, with the accession of Spain and Portugal, a decade on from throwing off their right-wing dictatorships in 1975 and 74, respectively. In spirit of greater economic and political cooperation, the UK and France announced plans to build a tunnel into the English Channel. In February, this was followed with the Single European Act, a major revision of the EC's founding Treaty of Rome, that pledged to create a single market within the community by 1992 and in order to remove trade barriers between members, to also reform the legislative processes within the EC. British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher was quick to claim credit for this boost to free trade, as it was her appointee to the Commission Lord Cofield that had drafted the white paper leading to the treaty. On the 28th of January, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded, 73 seconds after takeoff from Cape Canaveral, in the first fatal accident to befall the Space Shuttle system. Caused by a faulty O-ring seal, the accident was watched live on television by millions around the world, and in particular many schools in the US were showing the launch, as one of the astronauts was Krista McAuliffe, who was to have become the first teacher in space, and NASA had encouraged high levels of media coverage to promote their Teachers in Space program. The disaster led to the grounding of the space shuttle fleet for over two years, while investigations and inquiries proceeded, and the shuttles and rocket boosters were redesigned and rebuilt to accommodate the findings. The Soviet Union had better fortune in space, launching their new space station named Mir, which can be translated as Peace or World. It was the first space station to be built of a modular design, and was assembled in space with six new modules added over the years, the last in 1996. In early February, Pixar Animation Studios was founded in California, a spin-off from the Lucasfilm Computer Animation Division and funded by Steve Jobs, who became a majority shareholder. They had initially planned to produce a computer-animated film called Monkey, a version of the traditional Chinese legend of the Monkey King for a Japanese studio, but it became obvious that the technology to do this was still some way off, so Pixar would initially concentrate on designing hardware. In Haiti, Dictator Jean-Claude Duvalier, known as Baby Doc, son of the previous dictator François Papadoc Duvalier, was ousted. There had been riots and unrest throughout 1985 and eventually in January the Reagan administration pressured him to leave. He flew into exile in France on a US Air Force plane and lived in luxurious retirement until his 1993 divorce robbed him of most of his money. He returned to Haiti in 2011 claiming to be there to help reconstruction after the earthquake the previous year, but was arrested. He died in 2014 of a heart attack while trial proceedings were still ongoing. Likewise in the Philippines, the so-called People Power Revolution ousted President Ferdinand Marcos after 21 years. Again, the US government encouraged him to give up and leave rather than continue fighting. In the case of Marcos, he retired to Hawaii, accompanied by a 90-strong retinue and nearly a billion dollars worth of assets, including 22 crates of cash, 300 crates of jewellery, boxes of precious stones, and 70 racks of clothing for his wife Imelda. The US government were embarrassed by his arrival and his open ambitions to hire a mercenary army and retake the Philippines, but they were spared further embarrassment in 1989 when Marcos died of kidney, heart, and lung ailments. On the same day as Marcos fled Manila, Mikhail Gorbachev made a speech to the Congress of the Communist Party, outlining his vision for the future of the USSR. He laid out two guiding principles for his administration, glasnost, meaning openness or transparency, and perestroika, meaning reconstruction, signalling that he intended to fundamentally restructure Soviet society and the Soviet economy, 
making the former more open and less secretive and fearful, the latter more market-oriented and liberal. There was cautious optimism in the West, though many wondered if Gorbachev would be quickly disposed of by hardliners. Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palmer was murdered on his way home from the cinema, the first murder of a national leader in Sweden since 1792. Such was the perceived safety of Swedish society that he had no bodyguards or escort and was walking alone with his wife. A local small-time crook was convicted for the murder a couple of years later, but the conviction was overturned and no new suspect was identified until 2020, when, after an investigation involving South African intelligence, Swedish prosecutors announced that they were satisfied that the culprit was one Stig Engström, a graphic designer with a known thirst for attention, but since he'd committed suicide in 2000, he couldn't be brought to trial and the case was closed. And finally, Halley's Comet was seen in the sky, something that only happens once every 75 to 76 years. This was the first time a comet had appeared predictably enough that it was able to be observed from close range by spacecraft, which had helped astronomers understand the makeup and behaviour of comets. Halley's Comet was named after Sir Edmund Halley, who was the first to realise that comet sightings throughout history had been sometimes the same comet orbiting, but it had long been regarded as an omen of change. It appeared in 1066 before the Norman conquest of England, and is depicted in the Bayer Tapestry. It is thought to have inspired Genghis Khan to head to Europe in 1222, and coincided with the invasion of Hungary and siege of Budapest by the Ottoman Empire in 1456. It will next appear in 2061, when it is expected to be better visible than in 1986. So, there was a sense of change and upheaval in the world at large, and this was mirrored in Formula One. With turbo engines now universally in use, FISA took the decision to make them compulsory, to ban normally aspirated engines. This was primarily described as a safety concern, to prevent new teams from entering and being so much slower as to constitute a hazard, though there were some voices raised about the ever-spiralling costs involved in Formula One, not to mention the flip side in terms of safety. With no upper limit on engine size or power, the 1986 breed of Formula One cars was expected to be the fastest, most powerful ever fielded, which caused concern in some quarters. The most powerful engine was reputed to be the BMW M1213, developing north of 1350 horsepower at maximum boost, which is 5.5 bar or 79.7 psi, though no technology existed to accurately measure the output at the time. Engine manufacturers were even producing one-shot engines that would only last a few laps designed for pushing hard in qualifying. They were nicknamed grenades. The fuel tank was reduced once more to 195 litres, a much smaller tank. This didn't thrill many either, with teams and fans alike noting that even the 220-litre tanks had led to some rather dull economy runs or cars dropping out late on. There was a shake-up in the driver lineups, with Nicky Lauda finally confirming his retirement after apparently failing to agree terms with Brabham, and of the top teams, only Ferrari kept the same lineup as 1985. Not only that, several respected drivers had failed to secure seats by the time the teams lined up for the first race, notably Derek Warwick and Eddie Cheever, both cut adrift after their teams went under. Both moved into sports car racing and became teammates at Tom Walkinshaw's TWR Jaguar team. There was a shake-up too in the calendar. The dropping of the South African Grand Prix had already been announced, but there would also be no Dutch Grand Prix after its owners Senav went out of business. Sandvoort had hosted the race every year since the championship began in 1950, with the exception of 1954 for financial reasons, 1956 and 57 because of the Suez crisis, and 1974 while safety upgrades were made. Finally, Plans for the New York Grand Prix were finally shelved, so there were three new entries on the calendar, with the return of the Spanish and Mexican Grand Prix and the first ever Hungarian Grand Prix. The season would begin once again in Brazil in March, followed by the Spanish Grand Prix at a brand new circuit in Jerez. Belgium was again scheduled for late May, hopefully without the need to reschedule this time, and the British Grand Prix alternated back to Brands Hatch despite rumours that circuit would be dropped as its laps were becoming too short. The Hungarian race at the new Hungaro Ring circuit took place between the German and Austrian races, the former returning to Hockenheim, the Portuguese Grand Prix was moved back to the end of the year, and the Mexican Grand Prix at the upgraded Mexico City circuit would form the first leg of the flyaway finale, with Adelaide hosting the end-of-year party after its success in 1985. McLaren go into 1986 with continuity in most major elements. The MP4 chassis enters its third year with some more aerodynamic tweaks, powered by the same Porsche-built tag engine as last year, all supported by Goodyear rubber. 
However, the other teams caught up some during 1985 and Ron Dennis and co will need to ensure they don't stagnate if they're to stay on top. In Alain Prost and Keke Rosberg, they certainly have a very strong driver lineup, but a new teammate always risks upsetting the balance in a team. How Prost and Rosberg interact could be crucial. Alain Prost was, and remains as of 2022, the driver with the most race wins before becoming world champion, and his near misses over the years will have given him the hunger to keep doing better. His driving style is meticulous and precise, and suits the car perfectly, and he learned much from the veteran Nicky Lauda with whom he got along famously. Now he will need to stamp his own authority on the team. The 1982 world champion had won five races during his four years with the Williams team, despite their rough patch between 1983 and early 1985. Three of those races were gutsy drives on street circuits, Monaco, Dallas and Detroit, and he had a reputation as a superb street racer as well as being a combative, never-say-die driver. There were some who thought his scruff of the neck style might be too much for the precisely engineered McLaren, but others thought he might be worth a cheeky bet for the 1986 title. After a 1985 that could be best described as frustrating and promising in equal measure, Tyrrell go into 1986 with plenty of reasons for positivity. Money, for one. For the first time since 1983, the team have a major title sponsor in place at the start of the season, American computer firm Data General, which has helped the team pay for development of its new chassis, the 015, which is expected a few races into the season. In the back is the same engine as last year, the Renault EF4B, which the team are getting to know, and Martin Brundle returns for his third year on driving duties. He's joined by Philippe Streff, who made an impression of one sort or another for both Tyrrell and Legier in the last few races of 1985. The Norfolk-born driver has impressed in his first two seasons for Tyrrell, but has still yet to officially score a point, between the retroactive disqualification of all the points he gained in 1984, and his bad luck in 1985 that saw him score a clutch of 7th and 8th places, but never quite make the final step. If he was frustrated, though, he didn't show it, and continued battling away in the Tyrrell, while his former F3 sparring partner Ayrton Senna was covered in glory. Streff certainly caught the eye in his first few races in 1985, particularly in the last race in Australia where he came third, but only after nearly taking out teammate Jacques Lafitte in a rather brainless overtaking manoeuvre that blotted his otherwise impressive copybook. He had also made a debut for Tyrrell at the South African Grand Prix, boycotted by Ligier, and made enough of an impression to secure a full-time contract for 1986. The Williams team had staged a famous comeback in the latter half of 1985 after some years struggling to marry the powerful Honda engine to a chassis that was fast and reliable. Kaki Rosberg's efforts overcame the shortcomings of the car once a year in 1982, 83 and 84, and again at Detroit in 1985, before finally everything fell together at the end of 1985 and the team went out with three wins on the trot. The new FW11 chassis, designed by Sergio Rinland, with aero by Frank Durney, mounts the latest edition of the Honda V6 Turbo, and team and fans alike will hope that the new chassis and engine are just as good as the last one. Testing times look good, certainly. Mansell had confounded a lot of his critics in 1985. The good car and the competition with Rosberg bringing out his best qualities and putting him on the winning step twice in a row at the end of the season. He showed his famous grit and tenacity, but the car seems to suit his style better, developed as it had been around Rosberg's muscular driving. Mansell had often driven his more fragile Lotus to destruction, but found it much harder to do so with the robust Williams, and was rewarded with a fine season. It was clear his speed had challenged Rosberg, how will he stack up against Piquet? When Frank Williams announced the signing of Nelson Piquet, he simply referred to him as the best driver in the world, and indeed with the departure of Nicky Lauda, Piquet is now the most crowned driver on the grid, with two championships against one each for Jones, Prost and Rosberg, the other champions driving. The perennially cheerful PK had stayed with the ailing Brabham team and their powerful but unreliable BMW engines for longer than many others would have, and would hope to have the same relationship with Patrick Head and Frank Williams that he had had with Gordon Murray and Bernie Eccleston. However, he is used to being the undisputed number one driver and the focus of all development. Will he expect Mansell to move over for him? Brabham begin life without their talismanic team leader Nelson PK with an eye-catching new car. The BT55 had an ultra-low profile, with the new BMW engine placed sideways to allow for the reduction in bodywork, allowing more air to get to the rear wing. The driver was almost laid down in the cockpit, a common posture in the cigar cars of the 1960s, but less common by now. 
BMW had produced a special engine to go in the chassis, and Italians Elio De Angelis and Riccardo Petrosi, both race winners in the past, were signed for driving duties. There was a sense, though, that the two drivers were both refugees. De Angelis, driven away from Lotus by Senna's form, and Petrosi, a victim of the Alfa Romeo debacle, and signed because they were available and Italian, rather than the best around. Renault had not fared well after the departure of Prost, would Brabham equally struggle to outlive Piquet. Petrosi had won two races with Brabham in 1982 and 83, but failed to impress in his second year in the team and was let go, ending up at Alfa Romeo, which turned out to be an even worse move. And Petrosi often seemed disinterested at best and petty at worst, falling out with teammate Eddie Cheever very quickly and memorably taking out Nelson Piquet in Monaco in 1985. His return to Brabham raised a few eyebrows considering the manner of his departure, not to mention the Monaco incident, but he could regard it as a second chance of sorts. After six years with Lotus, Elio De Angelis had been made to look rather ordinary by Ayrton Senna in 1985 and decided to move on, signing terms with Brabham to drive the new skateboard car as it had been instantly nicknamed. De Angelis' testing experience, he'd had the lion's share of Lotus testing, came in handy for the team, but there had always been questions over his sometimes petulant attitude at Lotus, and everyone at Brabham hopes this will prove a new beginning for him. 